Alan says, expert class telling us what to do, uh, some model choices, small businesses in the extension, people losing their jobs, and many others stuck into status of a property less serfs. Joe Kotkin wrote a book, uh, Neo Feudalism. I haven't seen the book, Neo Feudalism, but I, I really do doubt that we're going to enter a feudalistic uh, society. I also, even though you put experts in quotes, I just don't like the using that term in a sense that it's good that we have experts. It's good to have experts. Experts are not a bad thing. It's sad that we now fear experts. It's sad that we fear elites. Elites in the sense of people who know, who specialize, who are experts. It's not a bad thing, but a good thing. I also think it's important to keep things in perspective. Now, I don't know what's going on in the UK as much as I do in the US, but a lot of small businesses were driven out of business in the United States. But what's interesting, what I find really interesting, is small business creation. The number of startups, the number of businesses created over the last year and a half in the United States is at record level. So what's happened is while businesses have been destroyed, other businesses have been created. So while I share the temptation of being super pessimistic about the world, about everything going to go to hell tomorrow, about uh, the economy is going to go to hell, we're going to have hyperinflation, the dollar is going to collapse, buy gold. I mean, that's very tempting to believe, and it's very tempting to get engaged with that. Oh, we, we, tomorrow is going to be authoritarian. We're going to new fleetalism. It's right around the corner. It's right imminent right there. As bad as I think things are, things are not that bad. <laughs> um, and I know that there's a sense in which that's a contradiction, but it really is. Business, small business creation in America is at record levels. That's just fact, just data. Um, I look, uh, you know, I invest in banks in the United States. Banks right now are super healthy. They haven't written down a lot of loans. They've worked with customers. They've, they've renegotiated stuff. So that tells me that there are not that many businesses that are completely shut down because if they had been massive bankruptcies, then banks would have felt the pain, right? They would, have, they would be writing off loans, huge numbers of loans. So as human beings, we're tempted to see um, anecdotes and extrapolate from anecdotes, you know, to, to, to induce from one example or to induce from three examples when there are actually millions of them. The data doesn't suggest that in the short run, things are as bad as they seem. I think things are really, really bad in the long run, but things are not as bad in the short run. They're just not. And, and part of it is because government has gotten very, very good, very, very good at mitigating short-term economic damage by sacrificing the long-term. So if what normally happens, if you will, if, if, if what normally is not the right term, but what you'd expect to happen is you'd get a sharp decline in economic activity because of COVID, a sharp decline because of the financial crisis, and then slowly get out of it and then maybe return to normalcy as the right policies are engaged in. What actually happens is you never get the sharp decline because the government won't allow it. So the government eliminates the sharp decline. But what it eliminates when it eliminates the sharp decline is also the recovery. And what you get is stagnation. What you get is slow economic growth. What you get is extended pain or extended mild pain rather than severe pain with, severe, with, with, extreme, with dramatic recovery. Government has become very, very good at dissipating the sacrifice and dissipating the cost over many people over many years so that none of us feel it. And indeed, most of the pain is never felt directly because most of the pain is in the lost opportunities. And that's brilliant of government and authoritarians and, and, and generally collectivists and statists. Because if we suffered the pain immediately, we'd rebel. We'd go out into the streets and, and rebel. 
But what they do is, for example, what did they do in COVID? They locked us up at home. We couldn't work. We couldn't make a living. They mailed us a check. Like, they sent us money so that we could feed ourselves. So, and, and the money they mailed us is almost the, amount, the, the same amount of money we would have earned. So we're not, we don't feel that worse off, right? In order to give us this money, they took on debt. And the impact of all this is that production is down, but we've all got money, so we're buying stuff. So production is not down a lot in the short run. And what we've sacrificed is the long run. That is the long run where we have to pay the debt back, the long run where we might have higher inflation than we otherwise would have, the long run where we didn't invest the, into the capital that we would have if the, if the COVID response would be differently, the long run in the sense that we, we suppressed innovation because of government policies. All the things we don't have, we'll never know we didn't have. So we don't feel it. So we come out of COVID feeling just as rich as we went in the, into COVID, even though we're poorer. We're poorer in a sense, not of we literally have less money today than we did 18 months ago. We're poorer in terms of the opportunities we face into the future. But how do you measure that? How do you even describe that to people? How do you explain that? That's so hard. It's much easier for the status to say, look, the government intervened. We saved, your, we saved all of you. We didn't have a bad crisis after all. Every, all of you have jobs. You all have money in the bank account. Look, life's good. Don't worry. Things are great. And statism works. Because even though we had a COVID crisis, everything's fine. But the story we tell is, oh, but if the government hadn't done this, we could be 10 times richer in 20 years. And people go, yeah, that's hypothetical. The fact is I'm not begging in the streets, which is what, which is what people like you would have expected that the economy would have crashed, everything would have been devastated. Our case on an existential basis is very hard to make because people are not feeling the pain of their decisions. The pain they're feeling is, again, in the lost opportunities, which does not have a reality to, for them. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they're missing out on. I am to begin with, I wonder if I can ask you to capsulize, I know this is difficult, can I ask you to capsulize your philosophy? What uh, is Randism? Uh, first of all, I do not call it Randism and I don't like that name. All I right. call it Objectivism. All right. Meaning a philosophy based on objective reality. Now let me explain it as briefly as I can. First, my philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute. That man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it. And that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality which has so far been believed impossible, namely a morality not based on faith. On or faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not an arbitrary edict, mystical or social, but on reason, a morality which can be proved by means of logic, which can be demonstrated to be true and necessary. All right, all right. Now, may I define what my morality is? All right. Because this is merely an introduction. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on earth and to live as a human being, he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold reason as his only guide to action and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind, that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness and that he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him, that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. All right, before we go on, reminder, 
please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now. Uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>